Welcome. We are live with our Hangout this month. We're going to be talking about holiday photos and vacation photos. We're just going to give folks a second to log in, so just stand by. We'll be starting in just a moment. For those of you joining us, we'll be starting up in just a second. Okay. All right, we have some viewers starting to log in, so welcome everybody. We have an interesting webinar today. We're going to be focusing on some practical strategies to get your holiday and your vacation photos processed and organized. It's sort of a, a two-step process. And my name is Rich Harrington. I am the publisher of Photofocus.com, and we're going to focus on techniques today that are very easily to implement for photographers of all levels. We'll be using tools like Photoshop and an application called Lucid, as well as a pair of plugins called Perfectly Clear that's available for Photoshop and Lightroom. And we'll show you a series of adjustments. I'll also tackle Apple Photos. And more importantly than just adjusting your images, we're going to show you how to not lose your images. We've got a guest expert today to talk about storage and workflow and backup strategies. So we've got a lot of cool things. So thanks for joining us. We're going to get underway. I'd like to introduce our panelists. Joining me first off is Levi Sim. Levi is a writer over at Photofocus.com as well as a professional photographer and a family man. Levi, I'm sure, like me, you've got a lot of holiday photos backed up that your wife and relatives are saying, where are they, where are they? Yeah, it's two months since, since Thanksgiving, and so, yeah, people are starting to ask for pictures. It's, it's time to get them done. <laughs> yep, that always happens, the need to get caught up on our photos. We're going to focus on some easy techniques and tackle common problems from sharpening to exposure to red eye to cropping for impact and getting rid of photo bombers today, all sorts of things. <laughs> and joining us today is Mark Fuccio, who is uh, an expert when it comes to storage and workflow. Mark, you are the vice president of products over at Drobo, and as well as an amateur photographer yourself. Why don't you give folks just a little bit about your background? Oh, I have quite a interesting background, Rich. Uh, it's good to meet you and uh, Levi for the seminar and our viewers as well. Um, I'm here in Silicon Valley. I've been involved in startups of all sorts, uh, both hardware and software web, for quite a while. And uh, my amateur photography, I take pictures on my iPhone because if it's going to be a separate camera or something, it's just too much stuff to uh, carry. So I'm looking forward to learning more about Perfectly Clear. I saw this uh, app at uh, PPE last year. It looks like it uh, will do wonders for taking kind of okay photos that you can take on an iPhone and really making them into uh, great uh, works of art. So uh, we'll talk about that and we can also talk about uh, some storage and you know, some storage myths and things and try to give people some news and a couple tips that uh, they can uh, benefit and start to apply right away after the seminar. Very cool. Well, we will actually plug in and show some mobile phone workflow in a little bit, giving you some things that you can do on the go. One of the first things we're going to tackle before we jump into tips is we do have some cool things uh, to give you towards the end of our webinar today. We're going to be giving out some discounts, which might be useful if you like some of the products we talk about today, as well as I've got a couple of copies of Lucid, which is a Mac and PC app, as well as Perfectly Clear, which is a set of plugins for Photoshop and Lightroom. We'll be giving away two copies of each uh, throughout today. In order to have a chance at winning that, make sure you take advantage of the Q&A pod. You can go ahead and post that, so just post a question there and you can easily do that. A couple people are asking, where is the show? So I'm hoping you're seeing it now. Uh, so I'll just go ahead and put those questions to the side. But again, feel free to ask questions using the Q&A pod, and we'll go ahead and get those in there. So thank you guys so much. And uh, if you are just wanting to chime in, let us know that you hear us loud and clear. That's also a great way. We'll get you in that queue. Just check in in the Q&A pod, and that way we'll know that you're in there. Any questions are welcome as well. All right, well, I'm going to start by sharing my screen for a second, and I want to talk just a little bit about one of the biggest strategies, which is culling and getting images down so that you can actually edit them. So let me just share my screen here. I'm just going to put the desktop off. And one of the things that gets a little bit challenging, let me just hide that really quick, is how we keep everything organized. So, for example, You'll notice as I jump in here, I have two Drobos, an A and a B, 
and on both of them is my photo library. Now, this is actually identically cloned, and we're going to talk a little bit about backup strategies in just a second, but I take a very simple approach. You'll notice that I just start to put photos into a folder based on the event, and preferably some sort of date if it's something that's happened more than once. Now, a lot of times, if it's a place we visit a lot, I might toss multiple pictures in, but this simple strategy makes it very easy for me to jump in, because what's going to happen is, invariably, you're going to end up with more pictures than you want. So, for example, I'm just going to jump into a folder here of a Santa visit when my kids were young. <clears throat> Excuse me. Forgive me for sneezing in everyone's ear. I was trying to cover that. <laughs> That's all right. And uh, you'll notice that there's a lot of pictures. And right away, not every picture is going to be an ideal image. One of the things that's sort of a challenge about holiday photos is a lot of times you are taking them in lower light. And of course, you could fire open that flash and blow things out, but one of the charms sometimes is the use of light. So one of the ways that I sometimes get around that is I'll shoot a faster photo meaning that if I have control on my camera, I won't tell it to keep the shutter is open as long. So, for example, here's a photo that's just a tad dark. Let me go ahead and open that up. And you'll see that I can actually recover quite a bit of that image without having to worry about it. I'll open that up real quick. And uh, let's just put this to the side here. And one of the things I can do is very quickly lift the exposure. So I just invoked a special filter here called Perfectly Clear, and one of the presets it has is something simply called Fix Dark, as well as Fix Noise. And you'll notice with lower light photos, we tend to get a lot of noise. That makes it easier to start to bump that up and recover some of the details. So that's just one quick trick that I'm sharing with you early on, and that is that you can recover those things. Now, I'm a big fan of keeping things organized by folder. It always makes it easy to go back. I found through the years that I've often switched tools and organization. For example, I used to use Aperture. Now I use Lightroom. I still sometimes find myself with photos stuffed in my photos for OS X app. But by keeping everything in one master folder on a drive that's big enough to hold it, because this photo library is sitting at about four terabytes, plus there's more images on here actually for video and other types of stuff, that makes it easy to keep it organized. I don't have it spread across multiple drives. Now, Levi, I'd be curious about your workflow, and then I want to get the, the expert to, to weigh in. What's your take sure. there? Let me just stop um, sharing my screen. I'm a little bit similar. I, I like to keep things organized by event. With with the name of of an event as the as the primary oh I need to share my screen excuse me um, because because I don't remember that I shot something on November twelfth you know two thousand eleven but I do remember that I shot it my um, you know you know I remember that I shot the Anderson family and so I can look it up by Anderson and find things really quickly or or I, I remember that I photographed. Uh, Thanksgiving, but I don't remember if it was on the 24th or the 27th of 2011 or, or whatever. So similarly, I like to use um, an event name, but I also use a year name. So I, I do I do my picture folder and then a year and then my events underneath that. And so like down here, I've got my Thanksgiving pictures, um, and and they're all ready for me. And like you said, having too many pictures. I've got 1,400 pictures from Thanksgiving. Um, however, those also include a long time lapse. <clears throat> so one of the things I like, and I'm using Lightroom, and I use I use Lightroom for my family pictures the same way I use it for my, my professional work. And one of the things that we can do with Lightroom is create a collection of pictures that references the files on the hard drive, on whatever hard drives they're on. And I've got I've got multiple hard drives in here as well, um, because I've got portable drives I carry with me, and then I've got my my Drobo here, and that's where I back everything up when I come home. And obviously I need to I need to get my family pictures back onto the, the backup drive because it's it's a it's a raid which Mark will tell us about, but um, I need to get those moved over so that they're well taken care of. But with multiple drives using 
the cat the collection uh, settings here, I can gather all my pictures from the holiday times into one place and have them handy even though uh, they're, they're from different drives. So I can have everything from my, my Colorado visit at Christmas time all gathered together here and I can have all my Thanksgiving pictures and then I can separate my Thanksgiving time-lapse pictures so that they're not uh, clogging up the, the uh, thumbnails down here when I'm looking at the rest of, of my photographs. And, and so I like the way that collections work for me that way. Yep, and that makes absolute sense. I'm a bit of a traditionalist or paranoid in that you're using a virtual catalog structure there where right. the database is keeping everything organized. I'm a bit more of a traditionalist of doing it actually on the folder. Richard Corfield, one of our viewers, logged in too, and he said similarly, he'll make a folder with the date in it and mm -hmm. then a descriptive name. And right. I think both of us are tapping into something which is good, which is at some point finding things by date is useful because you might be looking at a calendar or have a request come in. Other times, though, using something that's descriptive about the location or the memory kind of helps. Mark, what are some strategies here when it comes to keeping things organized on a hard drive? You've spent a lot of time studying how people work. What's going to be the best way to not accidentally erase your stuff or forget where you put it? <laughs> okay, so there's a broad set of topics here, and we'll let, let's let's talk about workflow, and then later in the webinar we can talk about uh, hard drives and storage systems. <laughs> so really, what you and uh, Levi are talking about is. Uh, what sort of metadata or tagging should you apply you know, to use to be able to find uh, images? And here, you know, I bow to a lot of the experts. And basically, what they point out is, you really, you, ideally, you want three things. There's more you can add to make you know, finding easy, in searching easier. But you, know, you want you know what the date is, and that could be as simple as Levi was saying, November 2015 instead of November 27th. Um, you know, sort of what the event is, Thanksgiving dinner, you know, vacation in Sweden, vacation you know, in Aruba, wherever, whatever it is you're doing. And then the final thing is maybe a combination of place and people. So that by doing this, if you are consistent in how you name it, you know, so, and this is, this is one of the consistency tricks that uh, people should use is if you want to use uh, folders or just naming of uh, individual images, try to use the same order of events. So ideally it would be year, event, place, and then maybe optionally you know, people involved. So if it's a large family gathering, you might, you know, you, you might have, uh, you know, you have grandma and grandpa or, you know, Uncle, Uncle Joe or, you know, cousin, cousin Roy or things like that, you know, that can just help, uh, you know, finding it. Um, that's text-based photography, very visual. I, obviously, you want to use other image previewing and searching tools which is especially you know, easy uh, to do on a Mac. So the key thing is uh, maybe actionable going into uh, the rest of this year is you know, start thinking about certainly any new photos that you create, you know, have some sort of consistent uh, organizational structure. And on uh, Macintosh, there are some tools like Text Expander, so you can make it easy to create little snippets so that uh, you, know, you can guarantee a consistency in naming. Uh, I do this a lot, and uh, not only does it save you time in entering the information, but most importantly, it's uh, really you know, a key benefit that uh, everything is consistent over time. Let me actually throw a tip out there for Text Expander, which is a great tool. Uh, what I recommend is be very careful when you're choosing those shortcuts. For example, instead of just RMH for my initials, I'll go RMHH, double tapping the last letter, since it's very unlikely that I would have a word spelled that way and it will actually go through and spell it out and put my full name in. So it takes those oh. four characters and expands them out. So shortcuts like that are great. Text Expander is a wonderful tool, so your tags or your folder names stay consistent. And we did have a great tip, actually, from one of the listeners, Tim Learmont threw in, that he makes sure that he sets his Lightroom preferences to write all of his settings back to the disk. Maybe you can bring that preference up, Levi, to show people here in just a moment. Uh, but that's a great one because while Levi is using a database, he's also being slightly paranoid and making sure that his data is stored safely. And we have other people chime in. You know, Mark, uh, hold your thought for one second. I want to show people one common problem with photos, and then we're going to jump in a little bit to some organization. 
and that is red eye. So one of the things that I have noticed is that red eye is going to pop up a whole bunch on images, and I just wanted to explain where this comes from. So essentially, red eye is caused by your image, and if you look at it here, you can see clearly red eye in our subject. Let's open that up, and I'll show you two ways of fixing that. We'll do it in Photoshop here, and then we'll also do it with Lucid or Perfectly Clear. So Photoshop, Photoshop Elements, iPhoto, Photos for OS X, they all have a tool. And what's happening here is that the light is being bounced back inside of the eye. And so if the eye doesn't have time to adjust to the really bright light, it often creates a reflection. And you won't see red eye in animals, but you'll actually see a greenish or a bluish tint. Now, Photoshop has a red eye tool, which allows us to click on the red eye and go through one by one and find each of those and click to remove, which is great. Now, I'll just take this back for a second. And, you know, that's fine if you only have a few. If you're looking to speed that up, you can actually see inside of a tool like Perfectly Clear, which is a plugin, that the portrait ones have a preset that's just going to jump right in and tackle the red eye. So you see oh, it yeah. use facial recognition to find the red eye as well as fill in some of the shadows on the face and get rid of those for us. And so there, with the one click, it applies it and gets rid of it as well as does some other adjustments. Now, if you're not a Photoshop user, when you drag in a photo with red eye, it has the same ability. It's just a checkbox for auto red eye. And I would also throw out that photos that have red eye are also very prone to having noise where the camera is shooting in lower light. So if you've got a noise removal, go ahead and enable that on your image so that it can get rid of them. And so you can see there that we've managed to get rid of that, clean up the noise, and get rid of the red eye. So noise and red eye tend to go hand in hand and keep an eye out for those two. They're going to plague lots of photos, particularly those taken earlier in the morning. All right, let's put that aside. That was just your quick technical tip there. So you had a chance to see that. I'll switch back here and stop screen sharing. And, uh, you know, Mark, you mentioned that you're a mobile phone photographer. The, uh, the iPhone even has a setting for this, right? It can strobe the flash. That's one of the benefits of the new ones and on selfies. Uh, you know, do you trust the auto flash or do you tend to turn it on or off based on your preferences? So pretty much depending on where I am, if it's a uh, you know, if it's going to be inside, you know, I'll tr it, the uh, iPhone. I have an iPhone six, six plus, so it has pretty good low light characteristics. Uh, I'll try not to use the flash because I'm worried about your reflections and you know other things that distort the image. Um, but if it's something where I'm uncomfortable with the ambient light, then I will turn on flash. But uh, to direct to answer your question, no, I don't uh, use the auto flash. Okay. Now, we're talking about organization again, because this is on people's mind, and we'll do some more techniques in a second. Uh, Tim was asking, do you rename through Lightroom? I often rename things and haven't had any problems. Uh, Tim, that renaming isn't actually happening at the finder level, right? If, I, like, if we rename stuff in Lightroom, we're just sort of virtually renaming the folders and everything else and moving them around. It's not changing on the hard drive itself. No, it, it actually does change on the hard drive. It'll... Okay. Um, when we rename a folder in Lightroom, it'll it'll alter the name on the hard drive as well as uh, image names. Okay, but that's not not if you just move things into a collection. You have to be actually not in a collection. That's right. Yeah, collections are virtual, but the file structure is your file tree at the at the Finder or Explorer level. Well, so, Levi, but... question for clarification: If you rename a folder, will it also rename all the images inside of it, or just the folder itself? No, you'd have to you'd have to highlight all the full all the images individually and rename those. Yeah. Okay. And and that actually brings up we've had a couple of people mention a few different problems with this risk here, which is sometimes they rename folders and then other apps get confused because now you gave the folder a name but you were linked to that in a different right. application, so that could be dangerous. Or things like the operating system not allowing you to make that change. Maybe you don't have write access or I've seen instances where maybe you're copying something to the drive and it's in the middle of an operation and it doesn't like that. So I guess, Mark, there's a certain danger in going too fast with photos, trying to copy, rename, and move while using an asset management tool to make changes at the same time could lead to a bit of disaster? Yeah, the key thing there is um, 
only one there's only one user you know, at any one time who's able to write to you know, to a file or an object. Mm -hmm. you know, sometimes if two users write, you'll end up with mush. So what most operating systems will do is they'll block you know somebody else until uh, you know, one user you know is finished uh, whatever you know his or her you know operations are. But you can, you're technically considered two users if you're trying to do something at the Finder level or desktop level and you're using a tool like Lightroom. You've got that's two right. different things making a change. So it's not just a physical person, right? That's right. It's two, any, any two programs. You know, it, and if we're power users and we're doing things in Finder and in the Lightroom, um, you know, maybe also trying to do a backup at the same time, um, each of those is going to be you know, competing you know, with uh, the others for access to it. So general rule of thumb is read access is, is not a problem. It's when two people try to write, that's when you get uh, mush, and to protect against it, uh, most operating systems will block somebody out. Okay. Well, block somebody, meaning a program. Well, and, and Lightroom actually won't let two users use the same catalog at the same time. That's, that's one of the big complaints is that we can't use Lightroom on a network but it's for that very reason, right? That, so that we can mm -hmm. completely foul everything up. And you, you learn pretty quickly what things are going to create a little question mark in Lightroom. Question marks are the scariest little thing. You click on a question mark in Lightroom and it says, this folder is lost, <laughs> and, or this, this picture is not available, and yet you have a little panic attack for a second. Um, and we actually cover a lot of these things in the book that we all just published. Yeah. Yeah, actually, there's a free book over at PhotoFocus, thanks to actually Drobo, who sponsored it, all about organizing your assets in Lightroom. So if you are a Lightroom user, you can go ahead and download that. Levi was one of the authors. There's tons of great things in there, and it's absolutely free. So if you just head over to PhotoFocus, uh, there's a story pinned to the front page about picking up our books, and you'll find a link in there for free on how to get that. All right, well, let's uh, talk briefly about a couple more tips. Levi, why don't you go through one or two images, and then I'm going to get uh, a phone plugged in to show a couple of mobile phone tips. Then we'll tackle, I'll tackle some travel images, and then I want to talk about keeping two hard drives in sync after that. So, Levi, right. why don't you take control of your screen? Remember to show that preference about writing the metadata, and right. uh, I'm going to get my phone plugged in to show some phone apps as well. Excellent. So the the to change that setting so that it writes the metadata, which when, when we make an adjustment to a picture in Lightroom, that adjustment doesn't exist on the picture file until we export it. And so in order to make sure that we, we preserve those adjustments, we need to go into the catalog settings. And you can get there through preferences. Um, and I'll, I'll go through preferences because in on my Mac computer, you get there through the Lightroom menu going to preferences. On a PC, you'll find preferences at the bottom of the edit menu. And then once you're in the preferences, go down to the catalog settings. And in the catalog settings, head over to the metadata tab right here. And make sure that automatically write changes into XMP is checked. And this is, is creating a sidecar file for, for your images and making sure that all the adjustments you've made in the develop uh, module are saved with the picture, not just with the catalog. Now, if you use the DNG file format, those changes are uh, included in the DNG file. If you keep your original RAW file format, like an NEF or a CR2 uh, from Canon or Nikon, then, those, then you'll see an extra file right next to your RAW file that says .xmp, and that includes all the Lightroom changes with it. So you just do that in the catalog settings under the metadata tab. And this is recorded, so I'm not going to go back over that and reemphasize it because we can watch this again, which I usually end up doing, to pick up a few more tips. And uh, this will be on PhotoFocus embedded there forever. So if you want to catch something we've already said, you can rewind and watch there. And I want to show you what I'm doing with one of my pictures. This is a picture of my daughter and my wife at Thanksgiving. And I want to just touch it up a little bit more. And I could either do that by right-clicking on this picture and choosing Edit In and going to Perfectly Clear. Or I can use the Lucid app, like Rich was doing. Since this one, um, I've already made a JPEG image of it, I can, do a, uh, I can use it in Lucid. If I'm working with RAW files, then I've got to use Perfectly Clear from Lightroom or from Photoshop because it piggybacks off of Lightroom and Photoshop's RAW engine to create a new file to work with the plugin. But since this one's a JPEG, I can just bring it right to Lucid. And it's already doing some great stuff. 
here's the before, and it's got this cool sliding reveal to show me the before and after. And like it's it's just touching up skin and removing uh, the the differences in in brightness and color tone, and oh, it just it looks really great. And so that's the details setting, but I'll come over here and choose the beautify uh, setting, and that gives me a little better contrast for people, and also touches up the skin really nicely. Look at look at what that's doing right here on the skin tone and everything. And then I can go into the adjustment tab and make some adjustments myself. Like I think it's maybe just a little bit too smooth. So I'll pull that slider down a touch. That's good. And uh, the skin tone is looking really good. Sometimes it goes a little overboard and I end up pulling that back a bit. Um, and that's, that's probably about all I need to do for this one. Although I, I do like to check the vibrancy and just see if I like it on and off. I like it in this case. And I also check the tint correction and see if it's if it's doing a good thing for me. I think I'll pull that back a little bit. In this picture, I like the warmth of the original, but this is a really powerful button, especially if I was photographing under fluorescent lights. So I like to use those. And then I just hit save, and it, uh, it saves my photograph with these changes, and now um, I'm ready to, to share it. Cool, cool. Well, that's awesome, and I'm glad you showed that tip on where to keep things. Uh, I've got uh, a tip about keeping your drives in sync, and Mark, I'm looking for you to comment in here as well. Let me just share my screen. And so I'm really paranoid when it comes to, to losing my family pictures. It's the mm -hmm. last thing that I want to do. And so I just want to share how paranoid I am, actually. So you'll see 5D A, 5D B, and 5D C. And so actually, in this case, my photo library is on three local drives. Now, I used to just keep it on two, and then I got really paranoid because I frequently have to travel for very long periods of time, and that's three copies locally. So what I'm doing there is I'm using a utility called a Carbon Copy Cloner, and this allows me to say something as simple as like, oh, my photo library that's here on this drive, put a copy on this drive, and every day at 11.30 at night, run it. And go ahead and also keep a safety net. So any files that were accidentally deleted on one but existed on the other would move into a folder so I can see it. And then additionally, I'm using another utility, which is cross-platform, called Crash Plan, which allows me to sync that stuff up and even tell it to do the same thing of push that stuff up into the cloud. Now, that takes a long time to push a four terabyte photo library into the cloud, but they do have services where the first time out, if you want, you can ship a hard drive in and they'll do the first backup that way. But you see the same thing. There's my photo library, and it's pushing that out into the cloud, and we'll keep it backed up. So it's going to go ahead and log in. And this even allows you to, you can use the same utility, actually, to back up from one drive to another on your system. I was already using Carbon Copy Cloner, but Crash Plan will work for one drive to another plugged into your system. So, Mark, I, I know that may seem excessive to folks, but my logic there, and part of this comes from knowing you for a while, is <laughs> that that's actually not that paranoid in that what I'm doing there is I've got them on two hard drives that can fail. Uh, my screen is just flipping back here, folks. I'll be right there. So it's on two hard drives, each of which could have a hard drive go down inside, and the backup, the RAID, will protect it. And it's going off-site. I, I believe this is a concept referred to by many as 3-2-1 backup. Can you explain the, the core logic here of why your precious photos shouldn't just be on a single drive? Yes. Well, you know, the key thing is hard drives are mechanical, and they will fail. It may be it may be five hours after you first start to use it, or maybe five years, but you know, they will fail, and all the data that goes on it uh, may be lost, you know, forever. Or you may have to go and have a very expensive recovery by a data recovery house like Drive Savers, and in which case you'll be really you know kicking yourself uh, where you sit down because uh, you know it's avoidable. It's avoidable error. It's just self-inflicted. So the idea of three, two, one. I think uh, that term is generally, to my experience, uh, attributable to Peter Krogh, uh, who's an author, has written a couple of versions of a book called The Damn Book, 
uh, digital asset management, and it has a, a site uh, by that same name. And the idea behind it is people change a little bit, three to one, but basically to be protected, you want to have three copies of your data. Uh, you, you want to have it on two, two different uh, systems, meaning making a copy of your data on, in, on the same hard drive doesn't count. You want it to be on two different hard drives um, and one off-site. And the off-site is because your house may get hit by lightning, fire, flood, theft, you know, any sort of physical damage. Um, you know, so you want to have one somewhere off-site uh, so that uh, you're protected for it. Uh, in the past couple of years, the popularity and explosion of available cloud services uh, you know, has meant that it's almost easier than ever you know, to upload uh, a backup copy uh, into the cloud. And you know, these services compete a little bit on price, a little bit on uh, the friendliness of their application, uh, and also uh, other value-added services like can you send them a drive as a seeder or if you know, your data you know, if is failed, will they write it to a drive and then send it back to you? Because uh, if you have a four terabyte library, it will take you know, months <laughs> you know, to upload that you know, versus just sending in a drive uh, via FedEx. Yeah, and actually to that end, Mark, you brought up uh, you know, the thing about drive failure. One thing that I like about the Drobo, but before I, I give that away, actually, we have a prize to give away. Uh, we did our first drawing, and our first winner is Alan Gale. So, Alan, you can reach out to me at rich at photofocus.com, and in the comments section, feel free to tell us if you want a copy of Lucid, which is a standalone application for Mac or PC, or a set of the perfectly clear plugins, which are available for uh, Photoshop and Lightroom. You are our first winner, so you can go ahead and let us know. And remember, you can be entered for uh, random picking here by just simply commenting in the Q&A pod. Now, Mark, you mentioned drives failing, and we've all had drives fail. Uh, it's mm -hmm. what happens after that failure that really matters. And so I wanted to show one thing here that I really like. So let me just pull this window out. And uh, I think you guys can see my Drobo dashboard here. So right now, I'm getting simple status updates. And these lights actually equate to the front of my Drobos. I can see right on that Drobo how it's doing. For example, these lights here, I'll do my firmware update later. And uh, you can see these status lights, these blue lights, match the front of my Drobo. But these tell me how full my Drobo is. And the green lights indicate the health of all the hard drive. Now, when I started with this Drobo, I originally had two terabyte drives in there. And now I've been able to upgrade to six terabyte drives. And I imagine in the future, as drives get bigger, I could put bigger ones in. But this is kind of cool how it expands. But what I really like is under my tools here, I have the ability to make sure what happens. So you know, if something goes wrong, I can actually have dual disk redundancy, meaning two hard drives can fail. And if there's a problem, right, Mark, we can actually turn on email alerts. So when I'm heading out of town, I'll often turn these on and then just set up the email, and it will ping me if there's a problem. Plus, I use a remote desktop so I can log in and just check my desktop right on my Mac or my iPad, and I can see my home computer, and that allows me to quickly just fire open that dashboard and sort of see how everything is doing, which is pretty cool. Because uh, I guess really a backup plan does no good if, you know, everything went wrong or you took a major electrical hit on your system, right? Right. And uh, building on that idea for email, so for, for Macs, there's many types of software that will sync from one to another. Uh, there's uh, Carbon Copy Cloner you mentioned. There's also Super Duper. Uh, I think Carbon Copy might be a little bit ahead feature-wise at the moment because it has a capability where it will send you an email alert you know, telling you yay or nay, your backup job ran correctly or it failed. You know, so that coupled with uh, Drobo, you know, again, you want to set these things up so you don't get ordinary status information, but you get an alarm and something went wrong, and that way, uh, you know, that way you pay attention to it instead of you know becoming immune because it's uh, just uh, infrequent spam. So um, the the key thing here is uh, you know, having multiple copies uh, of the data. So I guess the thing maybe take a moment to talk about uh, for your audience is. Asking the answering the question, what is a Drobo? Well, Drobo is a family of products, and what they do is, you know, they're all four or five or maybe some eight-base systems, 
and they solve problems that all hard drives have. You know, the first problem is they fail. Second problem is they get full. So what uh, Drobo does is it has, a, it has an ARM processor inside of it, so it's a sophisticated controller, is it pools all the storage capacity together. So to your Mac or to your PC, it looks like one big large uh, volume. And uh, that's important because if people have a lot of disk drives, guess what? You know, what's on which disk drive? You know, the more drives you have, the more opportunity is to lose something. So, uh, you know, more opportunities to accidentally unplug a drive in the middle of doing something. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's human error. It's, uh, it, you know, I've, and I'm sure you and your audience, uh, you know, probably have lost more data just due to our own fat finger you know, errors than actual hard drive or other failure. But uh, back to Drobo. So, you know, it, it, it pulls all the storage together so to your system it looks like uh, one large drive. Um, it borrows a concept from enterprise storage called thin provisioning. And what this is like is uh, like back in the old days where you, the expression you would kite a check. You know, you write a check out uh, to pay your, your power bill today knowing, okay, well, my account doesn't have anything until I get paid on Friday. But because it's going to pass in the mail, you're totally fine to send it out. Uh, Drobo works the same way with storage. Uh, it tells your machine that, hey, I'm a 16 terabyte or I'm a 64 terabyte uh, you know, uh, disk drive. And over time, you, you can start small and there's need more space. You can add a drive or pull a drive out and replace it with a bigger one. So by doing this, the storage space uh, will continually increase. And this is, uh, this is uh, very, very practical because uh, we just like to remember where things are. Levi mentioned he had multiple uh, Lightroom libraries. Um, you know, I, th I think the key thing that he said that I zero in on is he has one where he stores everything in his studio and he has another one for when he's on the go for you know, a portable drive that he'll be taking with him. Yep, and that backup and knowing which one is which is pretty important. Also, if you are in the field, I've had to start making sure that I'm making multiple backups in the field. I had a, mm -hmm. a big scare over the holidays. I managed to forget a hard drive with material on the road while on vacation. We actually have some great questions here about storage, so I want to tackle these. And then, Levi, I want to jump to you to show some other holiday photo problems, and then I've got some travel images to show. Uh, so, you know, it, clearly, folks, you, you're worried about your data, which is good. That's the first step to not losing it. But yeah. Uh, I, I left the drive on the plane drive recently, too. In a hotel room, and uh, that was scary. We were actually on the road for two and a half weeks. And then on a different hotel room, since we changed rooms seven times, I left a memory card. Fortunately, <laughs> I still didn't lose data because I had backed up those memory cards to two separate drives. So despite two acts of human error and stupidity, yes, I am human, I still had my data when I got back. I was cursing and I was annoyed because losing a hard drive, a two terabyte drive, and a wallet full of SD cards is a little expensive. But fortunately, uh, I, I took a trick that Levi and I both practice. I put a label right on my drives that has my name, my phone number, and the text reward if found. And uh, both of them found it the way back to me. So I gave people a reward. It was awesome. Uh, a couple of questions that came up. So uh, Tony Stage uses vice versa on Windows to copy files to Drobo and then to Backblaze, which is awesome, to the cloud. So that's another solution there for those of you who are on Windows. So good job, Tony. And you might want to consider picking up a slower unit to back up. Like, I keep that second copy local. That doesn't have to be as fast. Now, I'm using some Drobo 5Ds, but I held on to my older USB Drobos. They have both USB 3 uh, ones that are available, so those are cheaper. And if that's not going to be the one you're editing off of, that's just your local backup, that's a great way to do that. I think that kind of makes it easy for those of you who are saying, well, what's a cheaper way to get into it? Uh, Carol had a good question, and I'm curious what both of you guys think. She says, you know, memory cards are costing less and less. Should I keep those as a solid state backup? Is it safe to just toss a memory card in the drawer, in other words? Will it still be there? I don't clear my memory cards until after I get home. I found that it's cheaper to just buy more, and I apply a, a really simple logic. I travel with two card wallets minimum, one full and one empty. Uh, I put the ones that are good to use in the right pocket, and as I shoot, I move them to my left pocket. The ones in the right pocket are the right ones to use, and the ones in my left pocket are the ones that should be left alone. Now, if you have a SD card and you can pop the tab on it, that's another good way to keep from doing that. 
But Mark, Levi, what's your take here on just tossing the cards in the drawer as a backup, If uh, especially if you're a JPEG shooter and you're treating them like rolls of film that you're archiving? So I think the key idea here is uh, really for you know, having additional copies, you know, there are things you can do to try to incrementally remove uh, more risk, you know, that something bad will go wrong. So, you know, by uh, having having something with a drobo with a multi-drive enclosure, you're doing a lot to protect yourself against having, say, a single drive that you back up uh, your data to. And certainly, any of your listeners, if you're not backing up, if you don't have at least one backup copy, uh, that would be the key message, is go out and buy something. Uh, buy a single drive, buy a drobo, but uh, do something so that you have multiple copies of those images. Um, beyond do you, that, do you say anything? Are, are, are memory cards in a drawer going to hold? I know, for example, I've had the scary thought of going back to some of our DVD and Blu-ray archives, and they're now flaking apart ten years later. Mm. The uh, I, I took some out of the drawer the other day, and the silver fell off. And people also mistakenly think that hard drives sitting on a shelf are protected; they demagnetize, right? So let's let's take them one at a time. So the idea of putting a card in a drawer, um, it will store it. You know, over time, you know, there may be some degradation. Uh, you know, some of the the flash it needs to be refreshed periodically because um, what they're doing is uh, you know they're hoping that you know, they place electrons in a certain part on the chip and uh, that will store uh, the bits for the image. And over time, you know, you know, especially at higher temperatures, they may dissipate. So uh, you could do it for short term, i.e., maybe for a project or something, but. You know, I wouldn't rely on this as a strategy for you know multi-year protection. Okay, and uh, hard drives sitting on a shelf can start to demagnetize over time, and CD-ROMs and DVD-ROMs have a, a limited shelf life. We'll we'll come back to some of that stuff, Levi. Why don't you give us a let's change the other side of the brain, show us a problem fix for a typical holiday photo, and then we got a whole bunch of good storage questions there in the Q and A pod, Mark. If you want to take a browse at those on your screen, and we'll we'll tackle some of those in just a second. You ready, Levi? You bet. Let me share my screen with you. And and then after you do that, I've got the mobile app loaded up to show some mobile workflow too. Terrific. I'm exporting from Lightroom to Perfectly Clear uh, three different pictures, and it'll open all three at the same time in Perfectly Clear. Now you're making and me hungry, Levi. Some of you are crafty. <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, my my mother-in-law loves to to have have an activity, and so one of the things we did was build these little turkey cookies and uh, then deliver them to the neighbors and friends and things, and uh, that's a pretty good time. So. And it makes a, a fun vignette for for sharing the holiday photos as well. Uh, let me just resize this. There we go. Um, so here here's a, a fun little picture of my nephew, just staring at me. Why are you taking my picture again? And I see a couple problems with it. I shot this at ISO 6400 with the available light, and it's you know it's it's still a bit dark, and it's it's kind of noisy too. If we if we come in closer on this guy. It's a bit noisy, and it's, it's a lot orange. And so I want to conquer those few things. So I'll start with the presets. And the presets just give us a starting point for our adjustments. And the fixed tint is doing a, a bit of work there for me. Let's have a look at that. Um, oh, rats. I think I, uh, I think I hit a bug where I pressed the wrong button, and now it's saving the picture instead of... Uh, finishing it off. Yep, that's okay. Do you want me to jump in for a second? Yeah, jump in for a second up? while they load those back up. Sorry yep. about that. All right, so uh, Levi's getting those open. And uh, one of you asked, what about plugins for photos for OS X? Uh, I can't say anything that's unofficial, but that would be likely in the future. So uh, for those of you that are photos for OS X users, you'll, you should see that. If you got a copy of Lucid, you should be happy. And uh, let's just bring a few holiday photos in here, and uh, or some travel photos in, and I'll show you some problems that happen with travel images. And uh, a lot of times, I find, particularly if you're just out and about on the holidays, you don't always have the best light, and so you're dealing with some exposure issues. So I'll just drag these all in, 
And uh, what I'll say here is, is that the landscape preset is a nice start. You see that it really brings out the contrast, which I like. That's a nice quick fix. And if I decided that I wanted to just use that, I could say copy settings and We're not, paste we don't all see your photos. screen yet there, Rich. Oh, you can't see my screen? Let's try nope. that again. We're having all sorts of fun technical things. Yes. <laughs> all right. And put that to the side. There we go. So what I had done is I had go. dragged a bunch of photos in. And I just picked the landscape preset, which sort of boosts the contrast and brings out the skies a bit. And if you want to use those settings on images, you could just say copy settings and paste to all photos. And now they're applied. I'm also a big fan of taking a look at images side by side. It makes it easier as I'm tweaking to judge if I'm doing it the right way. Now, one of the things that's pretty important with your tourism photos and your travel photos is remember that normally as you bring up exposure, color gets washed out. Now, Perfectly Clear is unique. They actually have 240 patents, and one of them is that their exposure keeps the color there. But I like to bring that out more, and I find that that works pretty well there to really richen that. And Levi was showing an example with filling in issues. So one of the things that I know I use both in Lightroom and Photoshop is their Beautify preset. I heavily love using their Eye Enhance, which relights and sharpens the eyes, and dark circles to remove dark circles from under the eyes there. It just fills that in quite nicely. And so I'll just toggle that on and off and turn off exposure there. And you can see with the single image view how it just brings out the eyes. And that's something with travel photos. If you're taking travel photos and you're under outdoor lighting, it's really easy, particularly people wearing hats, shade, all sorts of things. Getting the eyes right just adds a certain sparkle that's kind of awesome to carry over. And so I'm a big fan of making sure that we get the eyes correct. And just about everybody has dark circles that they don't like. This is an easy way to pull those out. Now, if you're dealing with washed out photos, remember, sometimes taking the exposure down is going to help. Don't crank up the contrast. Bring the exposure in line right and that's going to help you really get that type of imagery. Now, I mentioned that this is also available on a phone. So let me go ahead here and just open up the phone. And I can do the same sort of things. Are you guys seeing my phone here, by the way? Yes, we are. Yes. Okay. So I just got back from traveling to London, and we were shooting later at night. This is in Piccadilly Square. And I actually fire this off as an HDR image. Now, one of the things I'd recommend is that you can capture HDR images on your iPhone using the built-in HDR app, or you can use something like Pro HDR, and that's going to give you a lot more data to work with, but HDR images tend to get noisier. So if you are shooting travel photos on your phone, try using the HDR mode on your phone, and then just take advantage of Fix, and that's going to go through and simply get the exposure right after the fact, as well as have the ability, if you tap the settings here, you can do noise removal because noise is very common in HDR images. So now we have a nice clean image, it's properly exposed, and the noise is totally toned down and that does a nice job. So then you can save or share that. I actually use this two ways. When I'm traveling now, I actually use a Sony a lot, and I also have an Olympus camera, and I know Panasonic has the same thing. They have mobile apps which allow you to sync images from your pro camera or your consumer pro-grade camera right to your mobile phone roll, and that'll push it in there. But then if one of those images happens to be a tad dark, no problem. You can actually fix the exposure right on your phone and then share it out to social media or save it back to your camera roll and get it out there. So that's just a little tip. Lucid for the phone is actually a $3 application, which is kind of amazing. And I'll use that in conjunction with the smartphone app for my camera, whatever that is. I shoot both Sony, Panasonic, and Olympus, and I love having that ability. Remember earlier I mentioned one great trick for travel photography and for holiday photography is underexpose a bit particularly if you're shooting in lower light. So if you've got that problem and you're shooting in lower light like I did here, well, it's very easy after the fact to just fix that exposure. So you can see how it fills in all those details, gets rid of those shadows and brings them back, 
it's always easier to slightly underexpose and bring things back than it is to overexpose and clip. Plus, mm -hmm. overexposure has a bad tendency of leading to softer images. All right, Levi, let's show your screen for a second, and then we're going to bring Mark back in. We've got a bunch of storage questions people are hanging with, so uh, sure. I believe you got that open. I do. I've got things working well now. And so with Perfectly Clear, I've uh, brightened up this picture. Like you said, it will never blow out the highlights. So even though uh, the hair right here is a bit too bright, even if I crank up the exposure slider all the way, it won't affect that brightest area, and I love that about it. And so I've also applied the noise reduction in the portrait setting, and then I usually pull it back just a tiny bit and uh, turn on the skin tone adjustment to tone down some of the tint on his face as well, and that's looking a lot better. Then right down here, I can click to the next picture and show you those turkey cookies again. I know it's lunchtime here, but... Um, so there's, there's my original photograph, and then just by going in here and clicking the details um, preset, it is brightening it up, sharpening things, giving me great contrast, making the color just look better overall, and it, I don't think I need to do anything else to that photograph. And then let's go to the last one of the cranberries, or the uh, pomegranates, and similarly, we'll start with the details preset, and already it's, it's looking a little bit better, a little bit sharper, um, and, and a better contrast. Here it's a bit dull, and then just with the details preset, it's, it's giving me a little more oomph, a little more punch. But I'll turn up the exposure a bit on this one as well, and then hit the fidelity button, because I like what that does for purples, and there's a lot of purple in those seeds, and it brings back some contrast and color range that my camera kind of clipped away. And uh, I might try the contrast adjustments here, um, which is what depth is. It's, it's a contrast adjustment, and I think I like the high contrast better than the high definition. And so there's the there's the before and after, and then I just hit save all, and they go right back into Lightroom, uh, automatically re-importing to the to the film strip right where I launched from. Cool. All right, we got a, a couple more questions for you, Mark Fuccio, related to keeping images safe here. So um, one person says, how do you check your backups? And uh, I'll share one strategy, and then Levi and, and Mark, you could put that out there. A lot of the backup utilities can do a verified backup. If you are simply just copying to two locations, or worse yet, you make a copy of your first copy, I've seen firsthand that you can copy corrupted data and it doesn't line up, but those, those utilities actually verify the data from one drive to the other and, and looks at the quality of the data, looks at the file sizes match up. Mark, do you have any other tips on that, on about making sure your backups are actually good backups? Yeah, again, going back to the you know, carbon copy cloner, it has a way where uh, it will do a verified backup and it will compute some sort of cryptographic hash, which is basically a unique fingerprint for the image and or, or the file. Um, doesn't need to be an image. It could be a document or a movie or an MP3, uh, anything. And it will check to make sure that uh, the source and the destination copies have the same fingerprint. So, you know, that's, that's a way to use an advanced capability uh, of that tool. Uh, I'm sure you know, there are many other tools as well that will do that. I think the thing is if you're searching or looking or considering other software, uh, probe or search or Google around using the term verified backup or verified backup. Okay. Very good advice. Levi, you have anything else that you do to make sure that your copies are good copies? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> I am, rely on the software? That's okay to do yeah, it. I, I, am, I am not the best at, at the, the damn workflow at the digital asset management. Um, and I, I'm learning stuff from you guys all the time, and I'm actually calculating in my brain here how much I can allot to buying another Drobo and becoming a little bit more Richard Paranoid. <laughs> not, <laughs> the one Drobo is not enough. I think I need two now. And uh, but so for me, one of the other things I do is is I deliver most of my pictures via Smug Mug, which is my online um, backup solution for for my photography. Uh, it, it's not a backup, but it's it's all my best pictures are preserved as a, as a full resolution JPEG that way and kind of after I deliver most of my photographs I rarely go back to them again unless they're my family photographs um, 
And so my my checkup is not up to date. You're pragmatic. You're very pragmatic. <laughs> yeah, I don't think pragmatic. Yeah, I'd also point out. I believe that Crash Plan also has uh, a capability and option where it will do verify. So uh, that's another yeah. uh, solution out there, and that's that's cross platform. So uh, it, that's another it, thing it, for your software listeners. Software is actually free. If you you don't even have to use their service, you could still use it to do drive to drive backup or backup to a friend. Yes, indeed. Okay. Free is good. So uh, we have another winner. So Joe Barta the fourth, you have won. You can choose in the comments if you want Perfectly Clear or Lucid. Uh, we have one copy of Perfectly Clear, two copies of Lucid left. So feel free to leave a comment there. If you are one of our winners, you need to send an email to rich at photofocus.com, and I'll get those sent out to you later this week so you can activate and pick those up. Uh, we had a couple of other questions here. Uh, yes, the webinar is archived. You can just go back to the, the original page that you found it on, and you'll be able to watch it. About 10 minutes after this webinar ends, you'll be able to pick up where you lost it. Uh, Speaking of losing it, Marsha had a question about, you know, how can I justify spending money on a, an expensive hard drive system? A uh, couple things on that. Um, I'm a firm believer that it costs a lot more money to recreate all of those family memories. So the cost of buying a, a unit doesn't have to be a Drobo, but having a multi-drive solution or at least two drives is well worth the cost of one drive. Uh, that's up to you. So, you know, I know a lot of photographers who will go buy a new lens or they buy a new camera body, but my choice before I go and buy something else to make another picture is something to keep my pictures. And so that's just something to think about. It's one of those things we don't like to ponder, but all hard drives fail. And it's important that you realize that that's going to be the case. So, and, uh, yep. And even if these aren't family pictures, Marcia, if these are just, you know, there's no just about photography. These aren't just flower pictures or these aren't just my f vacation pictures. This is your artwork. You have spent a lot of time and a lot of money developing your craft and it has value. You don't need to justify it. You need to protect it. Yeah. Thank you, Levi. I right, would we'll uh, speak. Go ahead, Mark. Yeah, I would just uh, also uh, just put in, in perspective that... Uh, you know, with uh, with uh, the special Drobo code you're going to give out, and that has been flashed a couple times, uh, the entry level four bay Drobo could be acquired for $199, and you know a three or four three terabyte drive is about uh, 80 90 bucks at Amazon. So for about $400, you can be getting uh, three or four terabytes of uh, you know protected storage space. And then that, that can grow over time. You can add uh, another drive uh, as you need more storage. Uh, you know, certainly you know, the higher next drove goes up, you know, ratchet up, you know, a couple hundred dollars uh, you know, each step up the product line. But you know that provides uh, in, in perspective. It's uh, you know it's way 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 economical compared to uh, buying a new cell phone or or certainly any type of uh, camera. All right, very good. Let me show a little bit more about Lucid for those of you who are interested in it. Lucid is currently available for Mac and PC. It is a standalone desktop application as well as a mobile phone application. The mobile phone version is available for iPhone. And uh, on the Android side, the app is called Perfectly Clear for now. Uh, but you'll find those. And essentially, you bring in a JPEG or a TIFF file into that application. And let's go ahead here and grab something from a holiday photo. I'll find something that's a little bit challenged. And so essentially what you can do is decide how you want to bring things out with that image. So let me take this one in here, and I'll just drag it in. And you can drag multiple files on We don't see your screen it. yet there, Rich. Oh, thank you for pointing that out. Always good. I always have a tough button with that screen share button. You see right. my screen now? Thank you, Levi. So let's, see let's grab Yep, there it is. Okay, so there's always a little lag. So let's grab a few of these here, and I'm just going to take a wide range of problems that we're facing, and uh, let's grab one with some red eye there. Should be good, and a little bit here with some exposure, and here we go. Now, these are tips that apply to all applications. I don't care if you're using Lucid or Lightroom or anything else. I'm just going to share some simple things. First up, uh, one of the nice things here is the ability to fill in those eyes. So I always find that doing an exposure adjustment on the eyes with a little sharpen is quite useful. Lucid and Perfectly Clear make that very simple, but you can do that manually inside of Lightroom with the adjustment brush. 
I find that enhancing your eyes with a little bit of exposure and sharpening goes a long way. And if you can tone down those dark circles, everybody has dark circles. Another thing that's nice is as you adjust exposure, consider putting a little bit of richness into the vibrancy, which is going to create a nice, rich, dark background. So when you compose that photo, pull that in. And don't be afraid about cropping. You can go ahead and simply crop the image to a target size for something that you might need for a frame. We can go ahead there and just pull that in. Or let's actually take this to swap the width and height. There we go. And so now I've got a simple 5 by 7 and I'm going to use just a little bit of composition there to cross his face so that he's intersected. Don't be afraid to crop in a little bit on the action to show more. Now, That's a good cropping taking, tool too. Yeah. And here's another example of crop. So in this case, you know, getting the faces lit up there, but we have a lot of distracting objects. We've got things like a Coca-Cola bottle and the morning paper. You know, you're not always thinking, nor is everybody looking out for you in the best interest consider, you know, just doing a custom crop sometimes. If you're putting things out to the web, nobody says you have to make a 5 by 7 Just crop in on the action. Always favor going a little bit tighter, and I find that that gives me a more emotional photo by just getting in on my subjects. Remove the distracting elements and punch in to really show your scene. That's just going to work a lot better. You know, and as you're dealing with those things, just toning it down a little bit. Again, you see that bringing out the eyes is so important on those photos. Same thing here. Tackles the red eye, which is great. So red eye is one of those things that always plagues the holiday photo. If you've got a dark image, don't be afraid to bring it up, but don't overdo it. Let the photo have a little bit of richness to it, and again, crop as needed. It's very simple to focus on your subject. And sometimes that's one of those things that people actually miss. They show too much. It's very easy to shoot wider these days and punch in a little bit. Pull it in and put the emphasis on your subject. And don't be afraid to sort of get a little bit more intimate there. I'll just go with that 5 by 7 and swap. And really punch in. You'll see I put the intersection there right on the eye. And that just pulls me into our subject. And let's just bring that out a little bit. So pretty easy workflow. That sort of stuff's going to help you. Snows are something that are often prone to a little bit of tinting. Snow is going to pick that up. So do a white balance or a tint correction when you've got snow. And if you've got skin tone blemishes, don't be afraid to adjust them and smooth that out a little bit. I favor more on the blemish removal than I do on smoothness. Me too. And and because uh, it gets rid of the blemishes, and then you could do a little bit of teeth whitening if needed, but don't overdo that. It'll look fake. But you see, it just brings it out, and by getting that exposure on the background, it's really nice. This is one of those instances where, again, I'll punch in. This evokes a square crop to me, and let's just place that. And so it's the way that she's looking, I'm going to give her just a little bit of room. She's glancing over her shoulder. So I'm going to give that a little bit of room over her shoulder so that it punches in on our subject. And I left the side that she was looking towards opened just a little bit. So those are simple things that you can do to really bring things out. And don't be afraid when dealing with stuff to just put a little bit more emphasis in there and some noise adjustment. That's going to just help fill that in quite nicely. You see we got great contrast there. All right, when I'm all done, I can click Save or Share Directly. So a couple of you are asking, what was that Lucid workflow? Hopefully that gives you the whole idea of the workflow. I could put those into Photos or Aperture, share them out to a social network, or put them out there for other folks, or simply click Save and put them out. You'll find more tutorials on that. Lucid is the consumer version of Perfectly Clear, and it's just designed to really speed things up. Uh, if you're dealing with things uh, in a Photoshop workflow, well, then you get the best of both. So, for example, I can take advantage of the best-in-class tools for Photoshop, like open up my RAW file for this travel photo, and under lens correction, apply my lens correction to fix the image, take advantage of things like upright to get the perspective correct or balance that out a little bit. I can recover my highlights and lift my shadows so I get a nice wide dynamic range image and then even open that up as a smart object. So now it goes into Photoshop 
and I've got the ability to actually evoke perfectly clear as a plugin. It'll apply, and I can simply bring out that. Notice there, there's Vivid, how the details in the rock and the exposure come through. What I love best is that it finds the black point and the white point, and you see the difference there between lucid versus perfectly clear. You have a little bit more control over depth to really bring that out. You've got higher contrast or higher definition, whichever one you want. Really nice controls on vibrancy. And Levi already mentioned fidelity. This is yeah, great at thing. getting blues yeah. and purples to snap into the right color. I'll sharpen that a little bit and get the noise reduction. And if we just look at the before and after, I think you see that even though I perfectly know my way around Photoshop, it's kind of nice to dial that in in just a few clicks and hit OK and see that image snap to life and have more detail come through. So hopefully that makes sense to you guys. Uh, let me stop screen sharing. And uh, Levi, why don't you queue up some examples? Mark, I see we have some more questions here that are going to help you. So should I replace a hard drive after some time just because it's getting older? In other words, a preemptive strike. I actually usually label my hard drives with the dates that I install them. But I, I think uh, you told me once that hard drives have most common are to fail early or fail late. Can you explain a little bit about failure and maybe pulling one out before it fails? Yeah, so the th key way to think about that is when you buy a hard drive, depending on the cat classification, it's going to have a warranty. It could be two years, three years, you know, maybe as much as up to five years. And what the manufacturer is saying is, you know, we'll stand behind this drive for this amount of time. If it fails, then at no cost to you, Mr. Customer will replace it. Uh, it's been my experience using different classes of drives and Drobos that uh, they all tend to fail within, you know, it seems three to six months of the warranty date. Hopefully, most of them fail later, but I have had a couple uh, that do fail earlier. So I think the key thing is uh, use uh, the tip that uh, Rich uh, actually it's flattering that he uh, that he that he took it and used it, and that is when you get a drive, put a label on it, uh, the date you know that you bought it. Uh, and then maybe plus three or plus five, so that you know what the warranty is. There's label maker, tool. <laughs> real easy tool. Label maker, fantastic tool. Right. <laughs> Perfect. I have exactly that same model, and so that way uh, you can go in and uh, start to replace them. I recommend about six months before that expiration period. That's when you, you think about going out and getting another drive. Um, the beauty of Drobo is you can pull the drive out, stick another drive in, and uh, it will automatically rebuild the array. Uh, somebody asked about uh, what the Drobo alert email will do. D you, know, you don't need to take special action with a Drobo in order to have it rebuilt, unlike uh, some other uh, you know, array, great array products on the market. It automatically will start to uh, rebuild. So uh, by using this technique of replacing a drive with a bigger one, that's how you can increase the capacity uh, over time. And um, Rich showed earlier an example of his five bay. We'd upgraded to six terabyte uh, drives. You know, I've done that uh, in about uh, the past year with uh, one of my Drobos. It originally had uh, three terabyte drives in it. And, uh, you know, I've now updated, you know, four of the, you know, four of the five are now six terabytes. So uh, I had had plenty of uh, capacity. So uh, just just to close, you know, yes, drives drives do wear out. They will fail. The key thing is to think about what the warranty period is. The drive that you buy, uh, mark your device so that uh, you're not, uh, you know, you're not not surprised. And uh, then just uh, you know make it part of your routine. Maybe think about it on your birth date is in addition to getting your physical. Uh, you know, also maybe think about your birth date because you're not going to forget that. Uh, think about on your birthday, just taking a look at your drives and you know planning if you need to you know, start to uh, you know refurbish and uh, upgrade. Very good advice, and I, I do find that drives frequently go on sale. Uh, one other thing that I always do is I keep a spare drive in the drawer, so if something does fail, it's easy to bring it back to life. Levi, you got some other tips here for holiday or travel photos loaded up? I do. I've got a bunch of pictures from our our time when we were making gingerbread houses out of graham cracker. You keep making uh, me hungry here, Levi, and you're so skinny. <laughs> it's not fair. Well, so the great thing about Perfectly Clear here is that I can 
choose to um, I, I could choose to open all of these pictures individually in Perfectly Clear and edit them, or I can go to the export dialog and export them en masse, and Perfectly Clear will cook them in the background and re-import them into Lightroom. And so that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to switch this up here from hard drive down to Perfectly Clear. And, and then, while you're setting that up, Levi, I'm just going to admit, folks, that I've done this before. I usually do this for first pass shoots, but the other day I was behind on some family photos. So let's right. just say I uh, made a preset that sort of worked with one image. You can use the system or your own presets, and I spit them all out. And wife was happy, grandma was happy, mother-in-law was happy, got it all done, and uh, that worked well. I also gave Lucid to my wife and to my mother. So uh, my honey-do list got a little shorter. Oh, good. That's perfect. Yeah, and, and I'm, I'm usually the same way. I'll usually open one, make it look great, and make a preset on it, and then that preset would show up here under my user preset options. Um, but for, for Alacrity right now, we'll just uh, switch and choose the details preset to start with, and then I choose where the pictures are going to go. I'm going to put them in the original folder into a subfolder. So that, so that I can navigate directly to them, and I'll call them um, PC Thanksgiving for perfectly clear. My caps lock is on. And then I want to make sure that I add to this catalog because I like to keep everything organized within my catalog. Um, and then I can choose the name. Like I'll, I'll, I'll stick Thanksgiving on here. And then I can choose the size of picture that I'm going to do. I'll, I'll just make them shareable sized here, sharpen for screen, and I can even add my watermark right now, which is perfect. And so then I hit export, and perfectly clear brings each of these pictures in and applies those settings and then resends it back over to Lightroom here, and we'll get, um, we'll get a new folder with the pictures in it. And right here, here they come, PC Thanksgiving. And I can take a look at these, and here it's got my, my logo in the corner, and it's got the touch-ups already applied. And these are importing as they cook. And so I could be doing other things in Lightroom. I could be sorting through the rest of my pictures while these are cooking, and I just I love how that works and, and makes me twice as efficient um, when I'm when I need to get these done, like you say, it's the the family is asking for pictures. So yeah, and, and that's the thing, right? Like those of us who are photographers who know better, I, I've discovered one thing that you know, sure, like you know, your family members are are shooting JPEG. They're just posting what they have. They don't go back and crop. They don't go back and fix. And the perfectionist in us, the the ones who want our work to look the best, want to fix it, and that's kind of right. difficult. You, right. you brought up a good tip there, though, Levi. You're working non-destructively. You're keeping them in a separate folder. Okay. That's really important. So Lucid will do that. It'll put them with a different name. Perfectly Clear will do that. It depends the name. Photos for OS X does that. Uh, Photoshop, not necessarily. It depends how you work. So I think it's pretty important. Mark, what are some common things you see people do to screw up their files? I was just mentioning one there of overwriting the original, but is there anything else that photographers do that are bad habits that maybe you can help break them up? Uh, yes, it's uh, sort of being undisciplined about where they store things. So, uh, you mean we I, shouldn't drag and drop from anywhere? Uh, no, and uh, making a copy of the photo on the same hard drive doesn't really count as having a backup. <laughs> a backup is a separate, distinct physical copy. Oh, that's an interesting tip, too. When you when you close Lightroom, you've probably got a prompt that says, do you want to back up the catalog? And I just skip that because it takes so long. Well, and it, <laughs> I, I have it set to remind me every time I close it because I usually skip it, <laughs> but I do it about once a week. And the important thing there is that it is not backing up your photographs. It is only backing up the information in the, in the Lightroom catalog, that XMP data that we talked about earlier and the, the structure and organization that Lightroom talks about, but it doesn't do anything to your original photographs. So that right. little backup does not back up your photographs. Yeah, so here's a, here's, a, here's a tip from Kevin Ames, who's another photo focus mm -hmm. uh, you know, contributing writer, and he's told me that the way he uses his Drobos is, uh, again, he has two 5Ds. Uh, one is of slave backup to the other. Uh, he backs up using Carbon Copy Cloner, 
And the way he has things organized is he stores his Lightroom, uh, the, the catalog, you know, on his Mac, and it's in a uh, you know, fast SSD drive, but he stores the master images and the media on the Drobo, and Lightroom is smart enough you know, to know how to go and find the Drobo that they're stored on. So by doing something like that, it's, it's a way that uh, you get the speed benefit of uh, SSD for storing the catalog, um, and you get the safety and volume capacity of having the Drobo as a repository for all your master files. Very good tip. And uh, a question popped up about should I use disk utilities on my Drobo? Uh, Drobo has its own disk utilities. You don't need to run third-party utilities on the Drobo, right, Mark? That's right. Drobo does its own housekeeping. So um, yes, you don't need to use tools to defrag it or anything else. Uh, it does that uh, in the background. What if, what if I bring in a drive that I used previously in another something or other? Do I need to oh. format that first? Okay, so uh, just a uh, step back for a minute. So I can think what Levi is asking is, you know, since you can put you know, a drive into Drobo at any time, what if I have a drive that uh, you know, I have uh, other material on? Can I reuse it? And it's a two-part answer. Yes, you can reuse it, but when you put it into Drobo, Drobo will realize it's not part of the native Drobo disk pack, so it will format it to absorb it into its disk pack. Sort of like the Borg in Star Trek, uh, you, know, you will be absorbed. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, so we've mentioned it a few times. I want to share that code for those of you who are interested in it. And uh, so let me pop that up real quick here. So if you are wanting to save a hundred bucks, this is a, a great deal. You can actually save a hundred dollars. You just use that code Rich100. I'm not sure how long this code's going to work. So if you try to use it and uh, you're watching a replay on this webinar, it, it's only available for a limited time. But that's a great deal. So take $100 off. That's going to easily let you buy you know, one, if not almost two hard drives for those reasonable size ones to put into that Drobo. So hopefully that'll give you something you want. Uh, while I'm here in Photoshop, let me show a photobomber tip really quick. So uh, I'm going to open up an image and you'll actually have this command available inside of Photoshop or inside of um, Photoshop Elements, or there's a tool called Snap Heal from MacFun that you can use, and it's good at removing things. Uh, let's do this one here in Photoshop. So here we have a be family beach vacation photo. I'm just going to draw the rotate tool there, the straighten tool right along that line, so we get a nice straight image, and I'll hit return. The horizon looks good. And uh, I'm a big fan of always recovering the highlights and lifting the shadows so I spread that histogram out. Speaking of which, a lot of people don't realize they can actually just drag on the histogram if they want to massage it a little bit. And I try to get a nice wide image before I hand it off into Photoshop and perfectly clear. Let's just go ahead and open that up. I'll hit open image and it sends it in. And what I'm going to do is get rid of a few distracting elements. So I can grab my simple selection tool here. Let's just grab the uh, lasso and I'll just lasso around my subject. There we go. And pretty simple. I'll press the tab key there. And I'll usually feather that real quick. Select, modify, feather, so it has a gentle edge. This gives mm. it really easy. So now we could say edit, fill, and take advantage of content aware. And it analyzes the pixels around it and attempts to fill it in. Now, I recommend you hide that selection so that you don't see it. So you can go ahead and get rid of the edge. Uh, it's usually going to be under, oh, I, I changed my height command. So usually it's Command H. That's fine. And uh, you can also go ahead and access that under View there. So I could say Show, and I could just hide that. And now it's not there. And if you invoke that again, every time you run it, it does a different content. So if you don't like it the first time, you can keep running it until it goes away. And we can select other areas, do the same thing, and that cleans it up pretty quickly so that the photo bombers are away. Now once, awesome. you get the, yeah, once you get the gross work done, take advantage of the spot healing brush. That's going to allow you to sort of fill in some of those details there. So that's going to be right here. Oh, where's my spot healing brush? The shortcut's J. That always makes it easy. There it is. And so I can use that and get a nice big brush and just paint going with the direction of the waves in this case. And that just makes that blend a little bit more. And that works well. 
and then let's invoke perfectly clear. Now, what's nice here is that that's going to give us really rich color. And so when I bring that out, I'll use details uh -huh. or vivid. It just brings that scene to life. You see that the color that was sort of washed out by the hot sun is filled in. You could go ahead and bring out that depth a little bit and set the exposure right. Nice, rich color. And fidelity is important. Notice how those blues that were all clipped get brought back. And so if, mm -hmm. especially if you intend to print this photo, that fidelity adjustment is awesome to bring the colors so they're print ready. Now, I showed you that in Photoshop, but here's what's kind of crazy. Let me switch over here and, uh, oh good, my kids don't have school tomorrow again for the fifth day this week. <laughs> <laughs> Let me go ahead and open this up. Are you still snowed in? Yeah, yeah, oh, there was man. 30 inches of snow. It sucks. <laughs> so I'm really, you might have noticed I'm showing some beach photos here for a right. reason. Um, let's just go to the camera roll here and uh, I'll, I'll grab another picture. So, you know, we'll go in here and I'll take something that I shot in the nice warm desert where there wasn't any snow. And uh, what you're going to see is that those images have a tendency to, to wash out a little bit. So let's take one that was a little bit darker. So here we are at the Pinball Hall of Fame. I took my kids back there, Levi. And I oh, can say, fix dark. And it just really brings that out nicely so that jacket got filled back in. And that's a good instance there where I'd select noise removal and crank it up a little bit. And now all that noise in the jacket has gone away. I can save that. Let's choose another photo here and show some of that same thing. So, you know, we went out for a lovely British classic Sunday dinner. Fix dark. So for those of you who are foodies, very easy to go in and then just tweak the exposure and bring in that depth so that you get the nice rich blacks. And remember folks, don't be afraid to crop. <clears throat> so we got an intruder there of an arm. Let's just position that over the food, pull that in a little bit, and focus on the subject at hand. There we go. And hit apply. And you got that better image and you can save that back. So the ability to do this right on your phone is just fascinating to me. I love how easy it is to bring things Here's a, a good friend of ours here, and I'll just click Beautify. And, uh, well, he's still not beautiful, but he's better. <laughs> so you see it pulled the cheeks in there just a little bit, lifted the shadows on the eyes. And here's my favorite, shine removal. So if you are out under hot light, you can tone down the shininess of the skin and pop that with just a little bit of depth, which is going to bring out the richness. And you see those blacks went black and we'll pull in a little bit of vibrancy as well. And now we got a nice frame, making it really easy in just a couple of clicks to tweak what you want. And so there's the before and after. And it's pretty cool how it combines some of that intelligent details. Now, we've got about five minutes left. We're going to do some closing comments from anybody that has anything they want to share. But it's time to give away a couple of things here really quick. So thank you guys for posting comments in there. And I'm just going to run the random number generator and pick our last two winners. While I'm doing that, Levi, why don't you share a couple more questions for folks, things you, uh, or things you may want to just share for some of your tips. You do a lot of family portraiture and a lot of family photo work. What are some of the things that you just think makes a better photo when you're on one of those trips with your family or with the holidays? Oh, for sure. Um, I, think, I think the main thing is to have your camera um, as, as <laughs> photographers. We often, you know, I don't, I don't settle for my iPhone anymore. I carry my, my well, I, I, use, I use Micro Four Thirds, so it's a small camera, but I carry it all the time, and because of that, I get, I get better pictures of my family all the time. And uh, even, even if I use the same, uh, you, you know, a similar focal length lens to my, to my iPhone, I still just get a, a better image than I can with, the uh, with the phone alone, and and so that's the main thing is carry your camera. The next thing I think I think you should actively use your camera. Like here's here's some ideas. Uh, let me share my screen again. And I I got up and went went shooting with my dad. And here's here's what we found at Garden of the Gods in Colorado. Okay, in your backyard morning. looks way nicer than my backyard. Right? Yeah, yeah. It's this is. This is where I used to work when I was a kid. I used to be a park ranger here in the summer times, and uh, and so I, I got up and went shooting with my dad. It was minus nine degrees, 
but it was absolutely worthwhile. And my dad's an amateur photographer as as well as a as a professional photographer. And so what we what we both do amateur photography is is our landscape work. And uh, we got out and froze our toes off, but had a good time um, working together anyway. And and making memories, making pictures, is pretty good. is a is a pretty good time. And these days, anybody can go out and make pictures. You know, we can we can use our iPhones as well and still go on a photo walk. Um, and so I I think you should just go make pictures and invite anybody in your family to join you. Good. Involve them in very, your home. Very practical, and a lot of times that stuff's right in your backyard. Well, folks, if you want to learn more from Levi, he's got a ton of articles over at photofocus.com. Uh, he also has some classes coming out on lynda.com soon, and he's co-author of the book, Organizing Your Images in Lightroom, which is a free ebook on our website, thanks to the folks at Drobo. I did draw our two last winners before I announce those. Mark, people were asking, where can they use that code? I believe it's the Drobo Store website. Do you know that URL offhand? That's right, www.drobostore.com. Okay, so drobostore.com, enter the code RICH100, and that'll give you the ability, folks, to, to go ahead and pull that off. So drobostore.com, RICH100, will save you $100 off of a Drobo unit. Mark, any other passing advice to photographers? I, I think it's really just a, a change in lifestyle, isn't it, to keep your images safe? It is, you know, because if you... Remember, during the course of the discussion, most of the time people fessed up to losing data is because we as human beings made a mistake. So you really want to get an automated system. And for that, since you showed the shot of Vanelli uh, with the London cops Bobby hat on, uh, Vanelli wrote an article on PhotoFocus, uh, I don't know, a year, maybe a year and a half ago, uh, talking about his backup strategy of how he uses a Drobo locally and uh, another Drobo model, the NAS model, to do an automatic upload to a uh, crash plan. So he automates uh, the whole, all the steps of the 3 to one uh, He gets his two copies locally as well as one off-site. So that's another resource that uh, your listeners here today go to the Photos Focus site and check out. Excellent. And those last two winners, for those of you who are wondering who were the lucky people, uh, they each pick up a copy of Lucid for Mac or Windows. That's Jack Larson and Marsha Facey. So just send me an email at rich at photofocus. Our four winners today were Alan Gale, Joe Barda, Jack Larson, and Marsha Facey. Uh, Alan and Joe both win a copy of Perfectly Clear for Photoshop and Lightroom. And Jack and Marsha win a copy of Lucid for Mac or Windows. And that'll give you a cool thing. Now, if you missed the Hangout, remember, you can watch the replay. My name is Rich Harrington. I'm the publisher of Photofocus. I'd like to say a big thank you to our two guests today. Thanks, Levi Sim, for joining us. Thank and you. Mark, Mark Fuccio, good to have you as always. Great insight. And uh, folks, follow Mark's advice. He's personally been responsible for keeping large amounts of my company's data safe. Uh, just to, to put you in here that the, the word is really in you know, living the lifestyle, let me just share my desktop here. This is my home system here. Let me just hit share. And uh, I am the sort of person who likes to keep his images organized. So you can see there, one, two, three, four, four, five, six, yeah, about seven. <laughs> so those are keeping everything safe, and those older ones can get recycled to be slower speed backups, but that's going to keep it simple. We use this at our work. I love it. And uh, I love also that workflow Levi showed you earlier about batch automation with Perfectly Clear. So if you are a Lightroom user and you have a bunch of photos just sitting on that drive for your family members that are waiting for them, go ahead and batch process those, get them out there, and get people happy with you. Well, thank you so much for tuning in, guys. My name is Rich Harrington with PhotoFocus. Thanks for watching.